Hey there, everyone. So, not too long ago on an episode of our Cool Capitalist Kids podcast, I explained why I don't make videos on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. For those who didn't hear, well, here's why. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez... No, I, I... First, before I start, uh, you, you'd think that I would have made a couple of videos, but I've only really made one. I've made a few where I've mentioned her, but I've only made one about her. And that's because I've been incredibly suspicious about, like, just how dumb she is, I guess, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, because, yeah, I think that it's really strange how this person just came out of nowhere, is this f***ing dumb, and everyone, like, the media is presenting it, like, oh, conservatives are so scared of her, and that's all that... Um, Fox News, The Daily Wire, and all these controlled outlets. Um, that's all they to ever talk about is Cortez, every little thing that she does, and the influence she's gained. It's uh, very strange. I, I think that that's... Uh, basically, I've been suspecting from the beginning that uh, she's an actor, and recently I've been proven at least partially right, like with the, the three chambers of government. And then in her campaign, she's demonstrated that she understands what the three branches of government are, and she structured a campaign strategy uh, around utilizing them. So the only time that I ever want to talk about Cortez is when she's actually proposing a law and the effect of which can be debated or measured. Her ditzy demeanor and hot takes are just an act, and while they're incredibly hilarious, she's being used as a propaganda tool by the political establishment to try and scare disenfranchised people back into the political system, back into dependence, and more importantly for them, back into voting. Though her apparent stupidity makes her a perfect punching bag for conservatives and Republicans, she is still a congresswoman authorized by the U.S. Constitution to produce the holy commandments of statist legislation. Thus, the official narrative is that, as far as conservatives are aware, she isn't just an idiot, she's a dangerous idiot. The difference between that guy down the street with a gun or Joe Biden with a gun. Thus, not only is she a bottomless well of content for the likes of Ben Shapiro or Steven Crowder, but she's really, really scary. And the only way to stop her is by voting. The last two elections have resulted in record low voter turnout as a result of the state's last propaganda efforts backfiring, which was to have two candidates run against each other for president. Both were trying to convince a segment of the population that if the other was elected, the world is going to blow up. Literally, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were claiming that if the other candidate won, they were going to start a nuclear war with Russia, and that voting for them was the only way to stop this. The intention was to try and convince the population that regardless of what side of the political spectrum they're on, that getting involved in the political system and voting was in their interests and that nothing else mattered, even if they didn't find either of the candidates appealing to them. And what ended up actually happening as a result was that millions of normie mainstream party archy contributors collectively f***ed themselves and ended up looking for ways to, basically for lack of a better way of putting it, stop the 2016 election from ever happening again, leading people to what before was the political fringes, and people who were so-called fence-sitters became disenfranchised because they were being fed nothing but political doom porn, but didn't want to become sucked into a cult of personality for either candidate, and consequently ended up realizing that the entire system is fundamentally dysfunctional. The enthusiasm for either candidate was pretty low. Don't get me wrong, there was a coalition of core Hillary supporters and Trump supporters, but most voters only did so in opposition to the other candidates. Voting was an act of self-defense, in other words, to prevent things from getting worse. 
Despite conventional thinking, elections do not actually achieve demonstrable political change, and the state knows it. That's why politicians and their controlled media constantly tell people to vote, and that voting is the only means to meet their own interests' ends. All political parties are simply state-owned entities, and consequently are run by government employees, made up of government employees, and operate for government interests. And in 2016, the state disenfranchised millions of people who were previously dedicated supporters of the current political system, or at the very least were convinced of the lies they were being fed, and disenfranchised millions more who had no strong allegiance to either of the major political parties, but simply thought that voting was a means to achieve their political interests. Nor does it make the ruling class in the priesthood of statism accountable to the people, as pro-democracy advocates would argue. If anything, it helps insulate them from justice. Not only in the sense that all states, even non-democratic ones, are geographical monopolies on arbitration either. But let's be clear, when people vote to hold certain priests of statism accountable for their crimes, they refer to them violating statist law. While third-party arbiters are a great way to adjudicate a case impartially, the conflict of interest in getting the mafia prosecuted for being a mafia by the mafia is deliberately withheld from people. Most voters have their own lives to live and literally can't afford to spend the time and effort to educate themselves to learn the conflict of interest on their own. After all, time is money, and Americans don't have a lot of that these days, let alone the ability to scrutinize an issue that has no direct impact on their lives and concerns people a thousand miles away whom they've never met. People's concerns with justice, remotely, while genuine, aren't direct enough to warrant personal investment, emotional or otherwise, which is what makes voting so useful for alleviating the anxiety one feels on watching the news and seeing people get away with crime. So if you don't have the time to look into the case yourself because you're not directly involved, of course, voting in the guy who says they'll prosecute the criminal sounds like a good idea, though that's all it accomplishes, alleviating your anxiety. The state won't prosecute itself for violating its own imperial edicts. And this isn't an academic question either. How'd the Obama administration's prosecution of Bush war crimes go? Has Trump's Justice Department even begun to file charges against Hillary Clinton? Of course not. This fact has become more obvious to everyone. The people who would be our so-called representatives represent only themselves and their interests. A fact that was made even more obvious in, as Esso said, the 2016 election, which put forward two candidates that didn't represent anyone's views. This was basically the absolute worst case scenario for any government which operates under an electoral system. The reason that governments like this want as many people voting as possible is that by voting, they've effectively conned people who do vote into believing three things. One, that the state is legitimate. Two, that you depend on the state to have your interests met. And three, that politicians can actually work in your interests. These are all vital to maintain a controlled political framework, and as long as people are convinced that there's no other way society could operate, that the state is legitimate, and that politicians represent them in the government through their laws, a relatively docile population can be maintained. If not, then people will look for ways to work against the current regime's interests. This is a large part of the reason why liberalism became so widespread so quickly. Feudalism had shown itself to be an inefficient means for an economy to organize, which was creating more cost to the state than it was generating revenue, and was creating an extreme scarcity of resources that led to an artificial halt on innovations and increase in prices. Under the blatantly iron-fisted approach of feudalism, there were revolutions every year or so as well. Well, and if that didn't kill people, then the rampant diseases, which were only rampant because of how little innovation was occurring, did. It's simply not possible to maintain a stable society, much less a government, under these conditions. 
But anyway, I am getting way off topic. The point is, voter turnout in the 2016 election was at a record low, was even lower in 2018, and now politicians are collectively losing their f***ing minds, and propaganda efforts like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are being created to try and manipulate people back into the political system. We can debate their intentions, but we know as a matter of fact that Cortez is not genuine, and I'm sure it continuously is going to get more difficult by the day for even normies to take her seriously at the rate we're currently going. Like, how she doesn't even know what World War II is, despite the fact her and her fans are constantly equating politicians they don't like to Nazis, or how she apparently doesn't know what the three branches of government are, at least that's what we've been led to believe if we took her at face value with the three chambers of government gaffe, despite the fact that she's clearly demonstrated an understanding of the three branches of government and how they're proposed to function, and even incorporated this knowledge into some of her campaign speeches. Occasional Cortex has teased the Green New Deal a lot these last few weeks, making Twitter posts about how we definitely need it to help the economy and heal the planet. However, until recently, we only had bits and pieces of a proposal, cap-and-trade style exchanges, promoting the construction of solar and wind plants. Well, now we're graced with the full extent of our plans. We'll include a full link to the manifesto and the FAQ in the description. It's only six pages each, so it's well worth a read. By all means, come to your own conclusions. But it's an interesting name, Green New Deal, meant to evoke the New Deal, the spearhead of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's initiative to pull the United States out of the Great Depression. This is no accident either. So what was the New Deal? Well, the New Deal was motivated by the mistaken belief that the Great Depression occurred because prices fell. FDR enacted widespread scaling down of America's production capability to artificially increase prices. The Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933, for example, tax goods that made farming more productive and subsidized farmers who cut back on production. Because everyone knows the best thing to do in economic hardship is make food more expensive. The National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 gave the National Recovery Administration, or NRA, a, a different NRA, the power to unilaterally enact any policy position they choose to favor at the time. Big business installed their cronies through regulatory capture and used their dominion to enact price floors, price schedules, minimum wage laws, and other forms of economic restriction designed specifically to price competitors out of the market and give the big businesses de facto monopolies, all enforced by the federal government, which further supported them through a concerted propaganda campaign that made parting with the government-enforced cartel agreements tantamount to treason. These policies, one among many, resulted in yet more unemployment and prolonged the Great Depression for yet more years to come. It seems like I'm getting off-topic, but you deserve the full context of what Occasional Cortex named her legislative proposal after. She is writing on the legacy of the New Deal, and it's only fair you understand without a doubt that its legacy is of tyranny and poverty. Honestly, I couldn't think of a better name for the Green New Deal. Now, the first section outlines the impetus of this proposal. Citing the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, which is immediately suspect. Any scientific group must exist independent of politics, else they invoke a moral hazard where in order to receive government dollars, Scientists put out the science that the government body they're attached to wants to see. With an issue as heavily politicized as climate change, well, there isn't much state money in disproving it. And you know this is true because so-called climate scientists were caught falsifying data towards a preconceived conclusion several times. You need only look at their rhetoric for their pseudoscience to be revealed. For starters, Look how vague their terminology is. Climate change. Just think about that for a minute. 
If the weather becomes anomalous in an area for an extended period of time, voila, climate change. With such a vague term, perfectly natural weather patterns conform to their confirmation bias, meaning that anthropogenic climate change is an argument with no null hypothesis. Yet in Occasional Cortex's proposal, climate change is often used interchangeably with global warming, a relic from the 2000s, which was swapped out when global average temperatures failed to increase. The problem with using them interchangeably is that they mean completely different things. Global temperatures rising, global warming. The nation of Peru becomes tundra, and literally nothing else changes? An example of climate change. Though Ocasio-Cortez's proposal does give examples for how weather will become more dangerous under climate change, with more wildfires, storms, and droughts. Wildfires, storms, and droughts. Huh. Funny how climate change only ever seems to make life on Earth harder. Almost, almost like it's a deliberate attempt to fearmonger. Hmm. I mean, you know what else climate change could do? Increase the amount of irrigable land, lengthen growing seasons, increase the frequency of rainfall, and reduce instances of human death from cold weather. But that's not scary, so you'll never hear about it. But it's so terrifying, you see that if civilization fails to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 60 percent by 2030, horrible things will happen. Reduction from 40 to 60 percent in 10 years? Well, she can't possibly be asking humans to exhale 50 percent less. No. She wants emissions as byproducts of machinery or production to be reduced by 50 percent by 2030. But it's not as simple as that. Since so-called emissions aren't just arbitrarily dumped into the atmosphere out of a sadistic desire for environmental destruction, they're byproducts of production, and how much is put out directly correlates by how much stuff is produced. So we can infer, quite strongly, that Miss Ocasio-Cortez is actually asking America to deindustrialize by 40 to 60 percent. Part of her specific plans involve overhauling agriculture to net zero emissions. So how does Ocasio-Cortez plan on all but eliminating agriculture emissions? Banning cows. She means banning cows, and arguably other forms of livestock. Don't believe me? In the FAQ, We set a goal to get to net zero, rather than zero emissions, in 10 years, because we aren't sure that we'll be able to fully get rid of farting cows and airplanes that fast. So unless the plan is to put corks up cows' butts, Cattle are being targeted for elimination from the economy. I'd argue it would go even further. Tractors will need to be banned since they create emissions. Fields will need to be plowed by cattle. Oh wait, those are already banned. Fields will need to be plowed by hand. Crop dusters and other forms of efficiently fertilizing fields will be banned. Due to the damage fertilizers do to waterways, they'll need to be banned too. Also, banned pesticides. You can see where this is going, right? The systematic deindustrialization of agriculture and the elimination of many technological advancements that made farms more productive and more efficient. We will see a return to 18th century agriculture, where fields were plowed by hand. Maybe because farming labor will be more in demand, this will create the jobs occasional cortex promised, but the inevitable result will be an agricultural sector far less efficient and far less able to meet the food demands of 325 million Americans. People are going to starve. Following the pattern of the agricultural sector, the transportation sector is targeted for massive overhauls, which means the elimination of transportation that emits greenhouse gases, not just airplanes, as suggested in the FAQ earlier, but cars as well. Their plan is to force people into using public transportation, but it goes even deeper. Getting goods and services from out of state or even out of country will be vastly harder, and the goods will come more expensive as a result. After all, cheaper forms of transportation across vast distances, such as cargo planes, trucks, and even cargo ships across oceans will all have to be banned. You can't transport people by horse carriage either, since horses emit greenhouse gases and dump manure on the streets. 
so everything will need to be carried, presumably by hand, and if what you want isn't produced within walking distance, it will be extremely expensive. God forbid you don't live within walking distance of a marketplace either. As if their wanton disregard for property rights wasn't bad enough, they want to upgrade every single building in the United States to meet the arbitrary demands of 15 bureaucrats. The state, with the power to modify your home or place of business to their satisfaction at a time and place of their choosing? What do you suppose happens to you, the property owner, if you resist? Of course they'll arrest you, and if you resist arrest, they'll kill you. To be clear, this isn't a bill moving through Congress, but if it were, well, I couldn't conceive of a better argument against the idea of the state protecting property rights if I tried. The Green New Deal will also be a collaboration with special interest groups who will unquestionably use the system to enrich themselves. Labor unions will have the sole exclusive right to work on any projects. According to the proposal itself, academia will try to enact their genocidal raging murder boners again and businesses will use it to raise barriers to entry into the marketplace and give themselves de facto monopolies. Purposefully cutting down production, intentionally making goods and services more expensive, while labor unions and private businesses use the government to enrich themselves? The more I read into the Green New Deal, the more closely it resembles FDR's New Deal. Now I've only just skimmed over the Green New Deal, and even then, only focused on the economics and production side of it. I haven't even gotten into the social justice side, where much decision-making power will be given to minority groups and minority communities, already favored by the bill, in an effort to fix the so-called social, racial, and sex gaps by simply throwing money at the problem. It goes without saying, how it will be used will be up to the discretion of the race hustlers and community agitators who will speak for the community. You don't think they'll enrich themselves at everyone else's expense? Of course they will. The Green New Deal will also provide for the economic security for those unwilling to work. Literally paying people not to work. Though some hoax passages from the Green New Deal have been making the rounds, the Ocasio-Cortez office has been doing their best to pretend that this line wasn't in their FAQ. It's important to recognize that this is a manifesto and not the draft for a bill which is planning on being proposed for the future as the media is presenting it, because this is a series of proposals for an overarching agenda, whereas a single bill is just one piece of legislation. Similar to the original New Deal, except unlike the New Deal, the Green New Deal is also being used to scare people back into the political system and is not just being used as a manifesto. If you read the manifesto, it's blatantly obvious that this wasn't written and published in order to sell these ideas to people. I mean, for f**k's sake, there's an actual section of the Green New Deal which would entail the banning of airplane travel along with cars that utilize gasoline. Nothing in this manifesto appears to be designed or even written as if it's designed to appeal to people. It only fear mongers and everything it proposes is sold as something people need to do as some sort of desperate measure as a result of what their envisioned regulations are going to do to the market, and not something which would personally benefit everyone. And across all of mainstream media, there has only been one article which argues for the Green New Deal as a positive thing for the economy, which actually attempts to make substantive arguments. And this is such absolute f***ing trash, I cannot believe that this was written by a sentient being, let alone actually published for a major mainstream media outlet. This person makes Paul Krugman look like Henry Hazlitt. There is actually a point in this article where it attempts to argue that monetary inflation doesn't exist and that the national debt is right-wing propaganda. 
This is in direct contrast to how the state will generally try to advertise regulations to people and their successful advertising strategy, which is to claim that their regulation is either going to make society more prosperous or it's going to stop bad actors who are harming people through malicious practices. Though, of course, a layman's understanding of economics can demonstrate that government intervention by default cannot result in anything other than scarcity and and the consequences of scarcity since they artificially increase the cost of production. As we have demonstrated, food will become vastly more expensive, as will any tangible good or service not produced locally. The elimination of nuclear power and fossil fuels will make electricity more expensive, as will the price increases of goods and services directly correlated with the de facto monopolies given to the Green New Deal's partners in the private sector. That's not even getting into the Brobig Bagnian tax burden and hyperinflation from the massive money printing needed for the state to pay for these programs. On top of that, it's being spoken about on every mainstream media outlet with direct links to the manifesto. The politicians really want you to see it, but there's nothing in it which was written as if it's intended to appeal to anyone who's not a politician. Am I suggesting that this isn't an actual agenda of theirs? No, because we know as a matter of fact that the UN, along with most governmental bodies, have been trying to move the world towards a state of rationing energy-related resources since at least the early 1960s. Before global cooling, which became global warming, which became the broad and unspecific climate change, which is now slowly becoming the even less specific extreme weather patterns, there were the forgotten environmental fear-mongering campaigns, such as overpopulation, later categorically debunked by the Simon Ehrlich wager of the 1980s between economist Julian Simon and pseudoscientist Paul Ehrlich. I may have to go into more detail about this in a future video because it's a pretty fascinating but long story and completely just debunks the idea of a Malthusian catastrophe. The point is that if the state has full control over the world's energy resources, they necessarily will have control over every commodity which utilizes them, which would include every means of transportation, any means of operating within any sort of building or complex, and the means by which people can harvest natural resources, which is why it's so important for them to control the commodities which are on the market through various gatekeeping institutions, such such as the FDA or the Patent Office, which de facto require state approval before you can sell commodities in retail outlets or through other means to a mass audience. And indeed, the state has a long history of trying through regulation, imminent domain, civil asset forfeiture of capital and investment resources, and gatekeeping what products are sold through various agencies to stop new products which require less, or in some cases, no fuels from being sold or the blueprints from being published. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. Water has always been considered a precious commodity, but Stan Meyer's invention may make it even more valuable. He has developed what's called a water fuel cell. It has taken the place of his old gas tank. The water fuel cell breaks down water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is used to run his dune buggy. I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, then use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. The most famous example of which being nuclear energy, which is demonstrably better for the environment, safer to use, and more powerful, requiring less input to receive a stronger source of energy. This is something which even NASA and the IPCC will reluctantly admit, even according to their own arguments, because the evidence is simply so overwhelming and self-evident when looking over the comparisons in any measurable observation collected by any organization. There is simply no way to spin this to where nuclear energy is more harmful than carbon. Despite this, the state will still deliberately try to suppress nuclear energy and has their mainstream media outlets publish alarmist pseudoscience regarding the supposed harm to the environment or to biological health, which they themselves admit is not true. 
Anyway, what I'm suggesting is that the sole purpose of this manifesto being proposed is not to try and sell the general population on the ideas of everything being proposed within it. I believe the intention of publishing this manifesto was separate from actually moving forward with the energy rationing agenda. I think it serves a similar purpose to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's gaffes, but also the media coverage that this manifesto has received falsely claims that this is a bill. And this is a pattern which repeats itself across every major media outlet which has covered it, even though Cortez and her associates have made it explicitly clear that this is not a bill. There are a handful of different things this could mean, but the most probable is that this is a form of misdirection, and the strategy for implementing the agenda is different than how it's actually being presented through the media, and that the Overton window is being expanded by attempting to normalize some of these ideas in the public discourse. Course. And if you're not convinced still, well, here's AOC herself saying that this has nothing to do with the environment and that the priority of the Green New Deal is state control over the market. Though it's worth noting that as of late, Cortez and her associates have received such backlash over posting this manifesto that they're now claiming the politically inexpedient sections are doctored, such as where it argues that people who are simply unwilling to work should have the government subsidize them, only fueling the flames because of how easy it is to prove that those sections are indeed not doctored and they've simply changed the manifesto to edit those sections out. My first thoughts were that this might be a milker bill, a bill that moves through Congress that's not intended to pass, but intended to scare businesses and special interests into donating money to politicians to convince them into either killing the bill or supporting it, turning the legislative process into a shakedown scheme. However, milker bills need to be threatening, and in order to be threatening, they have to have a good chance of passing through Congress at all. The provisions within the Green New Deal are so absurd, even the most paranoid of businesses would feel secure in it being dead on arrival, without them needing to pay off the mob bosses. They also have to be bills, which, as noted earlier, the Green New Deal is not. Filthy went on about the connections between the state and the organizations pushing the narrative of anthropogenic climate change earlier, and I've expanded upon the state's reasoning behind wanting energy rationing, but let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room before we continue. Anthropogenic climate change does not exist. Not only does it not exist, but it doesn't even meet the criteria required in order to be formally considered a scientific theory. Firstly, NASA has been caught blatantly manipulating the RSS global temperature analysis data sets without even attempting to explain themselves on numerous occasions. Remember that flat trend in NASA's satellite data for 18 years, which skeptics were pointing to that contradicted the state's narrative that the Earth was warming at an exponential and exaggerated rate? You know, the reason why they started calling it climate change instead of global warming. Well, that was apparently such a thorn in their side, which they couldn't bullshit their way around, they just straight up changed what the data set said, and now they're pretending that's the way it's always been. And the most shameful part is that 2017 wasn't even the first time that they did this. Hell, they did this twice in 2017. NASA and the NOAA also did this exact same thing back in 2012, 2014, and 2018. And there was also that climate research unit set of email leaks, which exposed government agencies suppressing information that contradicted the narrative of climate alarmism. They've just been caught lying so many times that it's a fair assumption to make at this point any claims from any government organization regarding climate data should be immediately scrutinized. Even with this aside, the so-called hockey stick graph should immediately raise some red flags for anyone except for those without context. And for those without context, the hockey stick chart has been used since it was first proposed in 1999 to argue that the Earth's climate has become gradually warmer since the start of the industrial era. And this has become the main statistical basis by which organizations or people trying to push climate alarmism 
make their case. The first problem with the presented data from the original Mann, Bradley, and Hughes study is that this data is broadly for the Earth's northern hemisphere, which is literally every place on Earth above the equator. This entirely omits the Antarctic ice core data, but despite this, alarmists still frequently lump in Antarctica with the hockey stick graphs data. Another issue is that the data between different attempts to sample global temperature varies quite significantly, so much so that the IPCC only recognizes a handful of data sets, and those just conveniently are the ones which omit everything past the last 1300 years and show a major warming trend in the last hundred. Why arbitrarily stop at 1300? Well, if you were to go back any further than 700 AD, you'd find that the Northern Hemisphere actually had experienced multiple warming and cooling period throughout the last 10,000 years. This alone provides a more plausible explanation for warming trends and definitive proof that climate change does occur naturally. How do climate alarmists explain warming or cooling trends which occurred thousands of years before modern industrialization? Well, it doesn't matter because any answer which is provided, such as an increase in volcanic activity, could also just as easily explain modern trends. So, at best, all this theory provides is correlation but not causation. It doesn't help matters that every time the state or other organizations and people peddling this woo get put into a corner by the overwhelming evidence contradicting or at the very least calling into question any notion that these climate issues are caused by humans, they attempt to backtrack and slowly start making the thesis of their claims more broad as an attempt to pretend that they haven't been contradicted by arbitrarily expanding their premise. First it was global cooling, then it's global warming, then it's climate change, and now it's slowly becoming extreme weather conditions. Aside from just being blatantly dishonest argumentation, the problem is that the theory is now so broad that just about anything which happens can be used as proof that the theory is being demonstrated, even to the point where it contradicts itself, such as climate change being responsible for shorter winters, but also harsher winters, climate change being responsible for less snow but also responsible for more snow, climate change causing droughts in California but also causing floods in Texas, climate change causing more hurricanes, climate change causing fewer hurricanes, climate change decreasing the spread of malaria but also increasing the spread of malaria, climate change making San Francisco foggier but also reducing the fog in San Francisco, and the list goes on. Basically, the premise has become so vague that it can now encompass everything as evidence to support the claims the thesis is making, even if it didn't come as a result of any sort of test to show a connection, and the thesis is now rhetorically structured to where it's impossible to falsify. As a result, the thesis now carries absolutely no explanatory power. Now, this isn't to say that a theory when proven wrong can't be modified and proposed again while remaining scientific, but every time one of these ad hoc reinterpretations occurs, the thesis has less explanatory power because the proponents, in the case of anthropogenic climate change, have done this so many times that there is now no way to falsify their theory and there are no predictions it makes which can be tested by observation. At most, anthropogenic climate change is unfalsifiable pseudoscience, but we know that there's no best case scenario here simply because of the demonstrable sinister agendas behind it and the outright lies peddled by its believers. But let's assume their fear-mongering about climate change is 100% correct. Just hear me out here. Let's assume that all their predictions about the weather, excuse me, I mean global cooling, excuse me, I mean global warming, excuse me, I mean climate change, excuse me, I mean weather again, are accurate. We'll have more extreme weather conditions, sea levels will rise, and all that stuff. Not one iota of these arguments justify government coercion. Since we can demonstrate that there is no logical justification for the state's mere existence Saying that we need them in this one specific instance is special pleading. Nevertheless, 
if there really is an imminent threat that can be objectively proven, then why wouldn't businesses work together to protect their mutual property? They could build the infrastructure voluntarily, and entrepreneurs will fill the demand for lower emission technology, like what happened with the Going Green fad about 10 years ago. Businesses have a glorious track record of improving our lives in more environmentally friendly ways, as I pointed out in my Pollution Problem video. All emissions are, now, are products the marketplace has yet to figure out how to commercialize. I know what'll happen, because it's happened before. Governments have no incentive to innovate, and cannot create new resources the way the free market can. The only way to sustainability is with free markets. The best way to stop pollution is with property rights. Whether or not you agree Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is genuine in her proposal, no problem exists, which can only be solved by your enslavement. Questions? Comments? Critique? What are your thoughts? Leave them in the comments below. If you like what you see, subscribe to Esoteric the Free, link in the description. If you're watching this on his channel, I'm Filthy Heretic. Subscribe to me, my channel will also be in the description. Anyways, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.